Hello there and welcome to episode 15 of the Koi Gang Pod on OTB Sports in association with Cabri FC, official sponsors of the Republic of Ireland women's national team. The podcast is OTB's home for everything WSL, Irish football and all the bits in between. I'm Kathleen McNamee and unfortunately we don't have Karen with us this afternoon as she's a little too busy. But don't worry, she will be along with us later in the podcast as we talk about my favourite thing in the world and not something that I've been pushing to get on the show for weeks now. But we are talking to Colin Feely and Emma Hansbury about setting up the new Women's National League team, Sligo Rovers. Fear not, though, I'm not alone for this first part of the podcast. Emma Carroll is here to keep me company as usual. Normally, we would be diving into our WSL review and team of the week, but of course, it has been an international window, so we don't have the option to do that. But Ireland did just finish their Pinnacle Cup campaign, so we will be chatting about that and what it means for the upcoming World Cup qualifiers. Emma, thank you so much for joining me. Loving the background for anyone who's listening on a podcast Emma has a very nice Ireland jersey behind her <laughs> yeah it's probably you know a little bit more on team I think <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely more, more on professional team. <laughs> this week yeah I approve well thank you so much for joining me and I'm excited to delve into this it was been an interesting campaign. I mean, Vera Pau clearly wanted to use as many players as she could to test out as many different formations as she could. I think there was something like a squad of 27 and 24 players were used in total. We had a few of people getting their first caps. We had Chloe Mustaki, uh, Megan Walsh, uh, Abby Larkin, who's only 16, which <laughs> has had an incredible couple of months. Um, what did you make of the entire tournament I suppose in general two wins and a loss so it wasn't a bad return for the team it's definitely good and it keeps the momentum then going into those qualifiers um, in a couple of months but yeah obviously the first thing was we were all getting ready to watch the first game and it didn't happen against Poland <laughs> and we all sat down so um, yeah we won 2-0 the two Quinn scored great. That's about as far as I can, can go on that one. Um, I think it was disappointing. Um, you can just see on social media that there was an uproar, which in that in itself is probably a good thing that people are going, hey, I wanted to watch this. Why can't we watch it? So the fact that people are actually saying that this this time around is is a good thing. Um, a shame that we didn't get the, the working links, but it seemed to be resolved in time for the weekend anyway, and we could all watch. Um, and by the time we got to the Wales game, it seemed to be better again because Saturdays it was hard to watch on that one camera view and everything. So the the just in terms of the actual coverage of it, it was definitely improved. Would have been nice to maybe have a bit of commentary. Very strange watching the game with no commentary. I yeah, did although I that. did, I did kind of enjoy being able to hear the players and hear Vera Pau because I know they're, they're, within they're, about five minutes I was like, oh, okay, then yeah, we can hear Louise Quinn back in the orders and <laughs> Kate and Kate telling Rusha where to go. So I guess you yeah. know <laughs> it's it's, it's a funny dynamic, but yeah, it was interesting to see exactly who were the voices and the leaders on the pitch as well. And Louise Quinn to me was probably the loudest of the bunch, and just it's like she could see obviously from her vantage point. And just telling people where to move into positions and when there was a player coming on to them. So, yeah, that was interesting as well to, to see and hear. Yeah, looking at the Wales games, it is the most recent one. It was a de- like it was great to get the win. Wales didn't really show up, despite the fact that they do have such great players. You know, the Jess Fishlock, Natasha Harding, players like um, Sophie Ingle, who plays with Chelsea. They looked like a poorer side than they actually are, but it was strange that Ireland seemed to almost be sitting back off them for a lot of the game. And even in the first half, like I think we should have gone in two or three goals up, but we didn't. We only had that one goal, which would be slightly worrying, you would think, especially because Vera Pau did say before the match that this was a team set up to win and it was a team set up to do the job and with Sweden coming up in April you would want to be seeing a bit more both in attack and defensively yeah like I'm just going to keep harping on about it I still don't think we got to see enough of Leanne Kernan I know she started the game against Russia on Saturday but and I think she got maybe 10 or 15 minutes against Wales but I just think in a game like that where there were so many opportunities had she been on the pitch a little bit earlier I think she probably could have got gotten herself on the score sheet because she's just on fire at Liverpool and the fact that 
we're crying out for goals and here's somebody that is scoring them and scoring a lot of them this season to not be getting that that game time, um, especially in friendlies where you can really have a look at her and see how she fits in. Um, kind of baffles me a little bit. Um, I think she, she's one that should definitely be on the pitch a bit more. Yeah, I was impressed um, with the way that she linked up in the Russia game with Abby Larkin. Like, obviously, you're not going to be depending on a 16-year-old going into World Cup qualifiers, but even as a look to the future and the possibilities that are there, I thought the way they worked together was quite impressive. And as you said, I mean, Leanne's on absolute fire at the moment. So there's no reason why she shouldn't be able to convert that over to the national side too. Yeah, I think some of the positives we can take out of it though is that Kira Caruso also looked really good. And Jess Sue, like she's just so exciting to watch. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm i not sure that we're going to see her in the WNL for much longer if if she keeps on the tra- tra- trajectory that she's on because... Yeah, she like it, it's just it's another bit of like dynamism like down that that right side. I just think yeah, she's young, she's exciting. It's something new, um, because we have that old guard of McCabe and O'Sullivan. That's all world class, but we can probably question where is that new youth talent coming from? And when you look at her, then you can kind of see that yeah, okay, we we have a little bit of hope. Yeah, I thought it was mad the Russia game was the first time in 42, con- the first time that Katie McCabe didn't start in 42 consecutive matches and that dated back all the way to September 2016. I was like, that is insane. <laughs> it's just like an it's, insane stat. It's just such a run and shows how dominant she has been. But yeah, when I was making my notes and wa- I rewatched some of the games this morning, I literally just had one line and it was just Jessu. I didn't even add anything onto it because she was just so impressive. Yeah, if we um, if we were having a team of the tournament, she'd, she'd definitely be in there. Um, yeah, and, and I think yeah. it is, she hasn't really been thrown into it. It's probably one thing that you could say Vera Powell has done relatively well in the time she's been with Ireland where you even look at the likes of Ellen Malloy she does give these players opportunities but it doesn't feel like she's rushing them or making them into stars or kind of putting a lot of pressure on their shoulders early doors no definitely not um and I think we've probably seen glimpses of her, glimpses of her recently and like some sub appearances in replace of Anya Gorman and stuff so yeah she's definitely been starting to be phased in but getting to see more of her in this tournament was just yeah I think she's definitely an exciting prospect for the future and um, especially like it feels like Anya might go on forever <laughs> but she's not unfortunately going to go on forever so to have somebody that has got that energy to get up and down the wing and um, it's 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 good and um, I think as well it was really nice to see Chloe Mastaki as well getting her um, debut after such a long wait as well yeah um, it was just like I think everybody seemed to be in agreement on that one and when you looked at social media it was just nothing but like positive vibes going for Chloe um, and, and it was yeah, a great it's, performance it's great to as see. well it wasn't just that she exactly. appeared it was a great performance I felt vaguely emotional watching her just knowing everything she had gone through to get to that point and then to get yourself in the mindset to perform that well on such a big occasion. And maybe it did help that like there wasn't a massive crowd there. Or, you know, it wasn't a particularly important tournament. You know, it was not a World Cup qualifier or something. Um, but no, the performance was just excellent, I thought. Yeah, I th- and I think though, like you do look at that game on Saturday and it was, it's great to see some of these players getting a chance, but you can still see that there is a bit of a gap between when a team like that plays compared to the team that played against Wales yeah. as well, you can just, you know, you miss your Katie McCade, you miss your Denise O'Sullivan, your Louise Quittens. Um, so, yeah, but it is important that these players start to bet in and get that experience because, as we said, like none of these players are getting any younger. They've got another another few years left in them yet. Like, don't mm-hmm. get me wrong, but we do need to start seeing that progression um, I'm- One of the things that did concern me from the Welsh performance and probably specifically looking ahead to Sweden as well was the fact that I, we seemed very willing to just like hoof the ball up the pitch and when we were defending in our defence at various points I think there was, was it Sari Holland put a corner in and we just couldn't clear it and we were scrambling and scrambling and you know Wales weren't putting massive amounts of pressure no. on us and that was such a good opportunity 
to kind of hold the ball, develop those skills, develop our passing in the way that we were starting to see towards the end of the last international window, that like how well Ireland were doing at it. And I was kind of disappointed that that old panic seemed to creep in a bit more. Yeah, I think when, um, and it, it definitely seems to happen when you've got, or the players know that they've got Heather Payne on the pitch, when they know that she will just run mm. and chase down anything. Um, so they can find that long ball as a way out or feel like it's it's a way out rather than, yeah. Like, and we've got players in there, like Rusha Littlejohn, Denise O'Sullivan in the midfield. They're all, they can all play. Like, it, it's yeah. not like they can't take hold of a game. So, yeah, we probably need to utilise that a little bit more. Um, and then obviously we had a mismatch of goalkeepers as well. <laughs> Isn't yeah, there? Nice I'm Megan still Walsh none the wiser as to who's Ireland's number one goalkeeper after that tournament either. Um, no, and it's gotten even more confusing with Megan Walsh as a mix now because you would say technically, if you take the WSL or like their club appearances, she probably is the number one, but there's been no point really where Vera Pau has actually gone with that because you would have said Grace Maloney would have had a lot more st- starts over Courtney Brosnan who doesn't yeah. even play regularly and uh, I'd love to know what's going on in their heads like what are they seeing in training? Love to, because you think exactly like exactly a term- tournament like this as well for a goalkeeper and a defensive block to start building relationships but did we even see Grace Maloney? I think she was injured. Yeah so we didn't so we've seen Brosnan we've seen Megan Walsh and we've seen Bandana as well so like it's just like yeah it's there's, there's just nothing you need to build that trust and that relationship I feel with a goalkeeper behind you Um, you can it tell in any team that that plays if they have a goalkeeper that they're not that's not the number one or that they're not used to playing that nervousness starts to creep in Um, I just feel like we need to get that position cemented um, if we have any hopes of going in, it, like against, well, if we get it, it gets you to the playoffs, let's say, because it's such a hard qualifying process to get through that if we have that position cemented, then it might give us a little bit more hope in, in creating that defensive block. Yeah, because it has improved in recent games, but there is still that. I'm just scarred from so many of the other incidents that have happened, and especially during the Euros campaign, you know we should really be going to the Euros this summer and if it hadn't been for some of those really silly stupid mistakes we would be and I just it's not that I don't have faith in the women that are in there but I just I a I don't know who the starting goalkeeper is b I don't know if they're trusting their defense enough and c I also just think that like you said you need the time to like build up your confidence to be consistently there I don't really think injuries or anything like that has affected it. It has just been a bit of back and forth. So I will be really interested to see when the Sweden match comes up, who Vera Powell will go for. Yeah, like everything that makes sense would say that it should be Megan Walsh. But because she's only just come into the squad and you feel like Pau seems to lean towards Brosnan yeah. for some reason, I just I feel like that will probably be the way she goes. But yeah. Everything in my head says it, sh- it should be like the goalkeeper that's possibly one of the best in the WSL at the moment. Like she's like up there with the likes of Mary Earps and stuff like that for her performances so far this season. When you take out those top goalkeepers from the top clubs, she's definitely the best of the rest, I would say. Yeah, well, even when we were looking at her stats a couple of weeks ago when we were doing the team of the week. And when you look at how high up she is in the all time WSL goal scoring stats in general, and like maybe it is a case of the team she plays for that she's had to make quite so many saves, but she's well practiced and she's making probably them so. makes her well suited <laughs> to coming to Ireland where a lot of the time you are just being hammered by shots and waiting to build up a counter attack. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, no. <laughs> hopefully it gets sorted and pinned down soon um, it'll be interesting to see how it develops mm. because how Maloney you? is also there as well and you know she's not having a bad season either at Reading so it just seems to be that Pau just doesn't seem to favour her for whatever reason so yeah it's going to be we're definitely kind of we've got goalkeepers there we just need to cement that number one yeah well and to Pau's credit and Brosnan's credit 
you can see the improvement in Courtney Rosnan in the last couple of matches, but just not fully convinced yet that she is the number one choice that we have. But all will be revealed when we play Sweden <laughs> in April, and hopefully we can manage a result like uh, similar to what we did last time and not let too many shots in. Emma, thank you so much for joining me. Look forward to chatting to you again next weekend. If you have any opinions, suggestions, or thoughts on Ireland's performance and how we're looking for April, please get them into us on Twitter at Off the Ball using the hashtag OTB Koi Gig. We'd love to hear them. Next, though, Karen will be back with me and we will be talking all about my favourite part of the country, Sligo, and what it is to set up a Women's National League team. Uh, so anyone who has watched the show or listened uh, either to Koi Gig or me just generally when I'm on Off the Ball, I talk about Sligo a lot. My first main show appearance was a Sligo special and I swear I had nothing to do with that. It was purely Catherine, our producer, who decided it might be a fun thing to do. I definitely didn't egg her onto it. But one thing I have mentioned quite a lot is the fact that Sligo Rovers have set up their women's team coming into the league for the 2022 season. And I'm so excited this evening that we are joined by Sligo Rovers CEO Colin Feely and player Emma Hansbury to talk a bit about what it is like to set up a team in the current climate how like all the things that goes into it and also what they're expecting from the league season so guys thank you so much for joining us tonight how are you both yeah we're good thanks Kathleen thanks for having us yeah same as that thanks for having us much appreciated and I'm feeling fairly outnumbered here today on the (laughs) Kind of so I go. <laughs> <laughs> normally it's all Karen's friends on the show so I feel like yeah. I have a slight upper hand it's purely for the only reason I've ever met well actually Colin we've never met before but Emma I just remember playing against you on a GA pitch I say oh. playing against you you were far better and I was sitting on the bench watching everything happen but I <laughs> Yeah, when we were up against Emma Hansberry, so. <laughs> so that happened against Emma playing soccer, so you're not alone. So, <laughs> no, Karen, that's we all know that's a like. Come on now, <laughs> and you too. <laughs> Definitely not true, but I appreciate the kind sentiments anyway. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for ha- coming on, guys. I suppose the best place to start is how are you feeling? Like it's been an exciting couple of weeks, just even from player announcements to having the few games before the season. Everything's coming together. I'm sure it's probably, especially for you, Colin, if you've been involved all the way along, it's probably the fruits of like a long journey in terms of getting a team to this point. Yeah, it's really exciting for the whole club. Um it's something that we've been looking through for the last couple of years. Um, we decided just to take our time with it and not rush into it and only do it maybe when the time is right and we knew we had everything in place um, because you didn't want to do it when we didn't have the foundations in place first, I suppose. So that's why kind of the idea came about with joining up with IT Sligo. Um, they have some great facilities and some great help uh, to us with all, all that they can bring to the table um, and join the in with the football club that we have um, I think it was a great thing to be able to do and something we're delighted with now and just two weeks out of the season we're, we're all really excited and really looking forward to it and I, I know the players and the staff and everybody as well um, are really excited and we can't wait to get going now. And Emma, how has it been for you to actually get on the pitch with and start to get to know your teammates? Because obviously it is a very new group coming together. There's, I'm probably presuming people you've played with before, people you knew of, but not necessarily a full squad that's ever trained together gone through that whole experience together yeah it's um it's been a great few weeks to be fair um it's funny like when we were setting up the team and we we're trying to think of players in and around Sligo I genuinely myself forgot about how much talent there was in Sligo um there was a lot of hidden gems that have come in that personally I, I completely forgot about or I didn't know um so that's actually been such a lovely thing to see that there is so many young girls coming up in Sligo and such a talent and actually when I say young there's quite a few girls as well who are like 25 26 27 so it's quite evenly spread out the age difference um but there, there is there has been a lot of um a nice few standout players come in over the last few weeks and um like we've been reaching to players in Donegal as well like up the very top Donegal girls traveling two and a half hours of training so um, it's really nice to see that commitment from people as well and girls traveling from Mayo and Leitrim and all on the outskirts of Sligo but in terms of local people I, I did forget like how much talent there was in Sligo so that's really nice to see again. 
Yeah, it's brilliant. Awesome. I'm seeing some of the names come through that, like, even were there, say, when I was finishing college, because Sligo had such a strong college team at that time, um, Interversities winners, I'm sure, around um, then. And you're seeing all these names come back. And that's, that's great as well for the league, because you're not starting off just as an underage team. There are going to be some experienced players there, because in the first year, it is going to be difficult for you. There's no point in skirting around yeah. it. Like, you're a new, very new team, and it's going to take time to bed in. But it sounds like you have all the structures in place. And having experienced pairs like yourself will really help guide those girls through what might be a few difficult games. But obviously, you, you have a plan looking towards the future as well. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right there, Karen. Definitely. Um, like Sligo IT would have always had a really good name for women's soccer. Um, going back to like seven seven or eight years ago definitely then like we were they were the best in Ireland over three or four years like consistently so we've been reaching out obviously to them players as well to come back and play with uh, Sligo Rovers and we've already got some some of the girls on board and then some other girls have prior commitments just by the time the team actually officially got announced and uh, Gaelic commitments is obviously a big part to play up this side of the country and um, so we have girls who are in now but also come June time like when the when the windows back open again we even we hope to even add like a few more like older and more experienced players to the group that we have now at the moment. You mentioned earlier Colin about like wanting to lay the foundations and make sure the team was set up right I think it was first publicly announced that the team was or the club was intending on setting up a women's national team around September and then December the actual application was accepted how long ago were these conversations starting within the club and how long have those foundations been built from obviously we know there's a massive under 17 and under 19 representation in the club yeah, I think um, our under-17 team are at it three or four years now and all the credit goes to those guys and, and those ladies who first set up that under-17 team. Um, and then, obviously, last year we added an under-19 team for the first time. So, kind of year by year, we've been looking to improve things from our side. Um, but always, the, the view was to always have a senior team at some stage. Um, and obviously, this year it, it's been able to happen, but we found that having an under-17 and under-19 team under 19 team was not a waste of time but um to get the best out of it and for to have the best pathway for these these girls playing you had to have a senior team because ultimately when they're sort of 19 or getting over age for that under 19 team you find them leave and fly go um having to go to places like Athlone um Emma you know yourself you've had to go to Wexford and Dublin and wherever to play um so we felt the need for to do something for the girls in this region um we're always talking about as a club, it's the region of the Northwest, it's not just Sligo. Um, you know, we have a, a massive catchment area of Mayo, Leitrim, Mastaman, um, Donegal. So um, we're the only senior team now in this sort of region, the Northwest. So um, we're delighted to be able to attract players from all those surrounding counties um, as well. So yeah, um, to go back to your point, I suppose these, these conversations started three, four years ago um, and they've really come to fruition in the last, 12 months really you know February March last year and um, we really got down and, and wanted to have a target of starting this year 2022 was the year we wanted to go with it and um, to just stop losing girls to go into other teams and kind of giving them something here with locally in Sligo to, to play for to strive towards. And was there anything in particular that it kind of started changing within the league or the system or was it just having those couple of years of having the underage teams under your belt and I suppose seeing what it takes to develop them and learning a bit more about the process of going senior or was it something like the amount of attention that the league itself is getting now or that there's more and more eyes being drawn to it? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's not, not, not much so to do with the attention it, um, it's receiving. It's just, again, go back to my point earlier is to give girls in the region something to, to work towards, you know, if you're even before the age of 17, if you're 13, 14, 15, whatever the case might be, you know that in six, seven years, you're not just going to be over age for Sligo Rovers under 19. You're not going to turn 20 and have nothing to do and go in and fall out of love with football or go and do other things. You know that if you want, you can go and, you know, be a professional footballer at whatever level. Hopefully in Ireland, there'll be more professional female footballers to come um, or whether it's going across the water to play, whatever that might be, at least for the same as the men's and boys players, you know, they, they have a pathway now, they have a, a men's senior team, so like I don't see why it would be different for 
um, for a girl of that 12, 13, 14 age group, or for even younger, whatever, whatever it is they are, they can see a future in football for them um, and that they're not just going to have to go in and do something else when they turn 20. Yeah, and the connection you have with the college is something I was really delighted to see because people often forget that age group, that kind of 19 to 22 year old age group, and the fact that you'll have a connection with the club and that. And also Sligo have always been traditionally good, but IT Sligo is expanding now up into Letterkenny and GMIT. So the catchment that you will have will obviously help Sligo Rovers in a massive way. And I think it's great that we'll have that pull because the Northern Ireland structures are very strong. Um, so it's great now that the Sligo kind of connection is there because I think we can pull a lot of talent into the league from that area. Um, so hopefully Sligo is the team to do that because I know we had Castlebar out west before and maybe it just didn't have the same reach that Sligo will have, hopefully. Is that something that you think he can do, kind of pull it in that extra pool of talent? Yeah, definitely. I suppose um, in terms of the size of the club, I think it would be fair to say we're probably one of the top few clubs in the country. Um, but I've been big head around and I suppose that's where we're striving towards, you know. In the men's side of it, we've qualified for Europe in the last couple of years, been in the top three or four. So as a club, we're on a fairly decent level. We would have a decent rapport with the local community and a fairly, we're kind of fairly well respected in the in the country, I suppose, from in a neutral supporters or supporters of other clubs. So I think we have a good name um, to build on and to have a foundation of a good name and a good uh, reputation is only a good thing. And to have um, an institution like IT Sligo um, which will be moving into obviously university status in the coming months. Um, it's, it's, it's a great foundation to have, um, and they've got great facilities. Um, they've got obviously their pulling power of their own, and to link up with them and be able to provide scholarships for these girls. They can play football for us for the IT and also get a good education. It's massively important now, and I think it's important for their parents as well that when they're going into TY up the fifth year leaving, so that they know that. You know, if they're really focused on football, that Sly Grovers are going to be drilling it into them that it's important to get your education as well alongside that. And that's one of the main things here with us. You know, we don't want anyone to just totally focus on the football side and forget about their academic studies and stuff. Um, it has to go kind of hand in hand with that. So um, to have the link with the IT is massive. Yeah, and um, the pulling power of them alone is, is great for us because it'll only help our player pool as well. And I don't know how you'd feel about this, but I know growing up in Sligo, and again, it's something that I've mentioned a few times when we've had different people on the podcast, but the fact that for me, it, I always knew about Sligo Rovers, like followed all the lads all the way through, like lived through all the successes, felt all the lows as well, but never really massively felt like there was that avenue to properly explore soccer, whether it was in my local community or even traveling around the county. Was that a similar enough experience for you growing up or were you maybe a bit more fortunate in where you were that you were able to have a team? And what does it mean now to you looking, say, on the younger players you do have on the squad or the ones who might come up through the younger ages and have this opportunity to actually play and say for the squad to go into schools like the Earth Line, the Mercy, the Grammar, or wherever it was there all over the county and show that, okay, we've had the lad success for so long, but you can also be a part of this like as a girl or a woman as well. Yeah, um, I was the same as you now, to be fair, growing up, um, Sligo Rovers, the showgrounds is literally 30 seconds from my house here, so I used to literally hop the fence in my back garden and I'm literally up in the showgrounds in the stadium and on their training pitch, so I used to always be heading up there every Saturday night for the games. Um, it's probably something I never thought of, actually, as a kid, to be honest with you, that Sligo Rovers would ever have, like, a women's team in the Women's National League and... Um, it's no disrespect to Sligo Rovers, but even when I would have been playing with Wexford Youths, I didn't even think that it was in such a close time frame that Sligo Rovers would, would eventually get a team together. But probably what like really hit home for me with Rovers getting a women's national league team was um, like when I moved home last summer um, from the UK, I went in coaching with the Sligo Rovers under 17s girls. And I honestly have to say, like, I have to be really honest and say, I, I couldn't believe the talent of them. They were, they were, they're amazing. They're such a talented group of girls. Um, and I've been out of the country really like the last three years. So I haven't really been around much youth football in Sligo or in Ireland. I haven't been to many games. Um, 
And when I came home last summer, my coach and I, I really was shocked at the standard and how how much it's lifted, probably compared to when me and Karen were playing years ago, like when we were playing with our little home clubs, like back wherever <laughs> wherever we're both from or wherever anyone else is from. Um, and not being funny, but Karen, I presume, was the standout player on her team as well, underage back in the day. And when I came in with these girls, I just couldn't believe it. And I had really a lot of conversations with Conor O'Grady in particular in the showgrounds. He's the head of academy and like really tried to encourage them as well to go for the, the women's team. It was they were heavily in talks like last summer about trying to get a women's team. And when I seen that, I knew that there was so much talent, but so much talent that could have went to waste if they didn't actually act on this team because the 17s girls we have, and they were feeding into the under 19 team. The under 19 team had excellent players as well. And all I was thinking was, like, where are these players going to go if we don't get a team together and quickly at that? Um, so I'm really happy now to be able to say that we do obviously have a team and that there is that pathway for the, like, we at the moment are senior squad, like, we still have. Um, a few under 17s players like actually who have stepped up now they've nearly bypassed the under 19 squad and they're straight into the senior squad we have two girls who have done that like because they're they're good enough to do that we have four under 19 girls who are like who are in our squad now for the season and that's that and I'm just I was just thinking last summer there could have been so many players wasted or so much talent wasted if the Rovers girls didn't get a team together um so yeah, it's, it's really, really nice to see that. I don't know if I answered your question there, but I hope I got to, <laughs> no, you to did, yeah. There's a lot going on there at the start. I trying to think back. <laughs> we, we're seeing a similar pattern as well, like the talent of our underage girls. Like they're coming from a higher base than we did when we were yeah. that age because they've been playing on girls' teams at a high level. And now these girls are, they're 17, but they're ready for senior. And you obviously now have that facility to provide them because otherwise they might have just played at their own age group and been happy at that and then maybe gone to college and got different interests and stuff but the fact that you can promote them now and recognize their talent so early that's going to keep them in the game more and obviously grow it in the region as well and we're seeing that all around the country but particularly great for a region that maybe was at risk of losing girls like that because the bigger the pool of talent across the country obviously the better it is for the league, for national teams. So I'm sure under 19s, under 17s, international coaches would be delighted to see their girls getting senior experience as well this year. Yeah, and just actually touching on that when you're on about college there, Karen, we have a couple of girls in from Donegal, but these same girls were looking at going to Carlow IT just so that they could go and play football with the likes of Wexford Youths or a Dublin team. Because before Rovers came on board, they, they literally had no other option. But now, so that you would have been talking, getting Dunny Girl girls to move to Carlo, to study in Carlo, and to play football, just for the sake really of trying to play football at a high level, to play in the Women's National League because they're underage internationals. Whereas now with the IT Sligo team, they're literally moving an hour and a half, two hours up the road instead of traveling hours to Carlo and probably getting home once every six or seven months realistically. So now with this scholarship system with the IT, like we can really attract players from the top end of Donegal or Mayo, Leitrim, Roscommon, Cavan, like Theo's already said. Um, so I think the IT partnership has, will, not so much this season, but next season and going forward will play like a massive role in attracting players like to come to Sligo for sure. When you're looking at setting up things like that, like, say we have the mixture of you have the scholarship you just have the basic logistics of applying to the league to get a place to finding where your players will come from I know Sligo had that strong academy route so it, maybe that was something that you could tap back into but just Colin to ask you like what are the actual logistics that go behind setting up a team in this capacity? Yeah so I suppose first off you have to have the initial conversations with um, within the club and then with the IT as well to see how do we the uh, the means to go and put a team together and put a team into the league, you know, we have to draw up our cost of what we expect to spend on it, maybe what we expect to, to get in, in into the club in terms of finance uh, to run the team. And then from that, it was just about going and applying to the FEI, presenting to the FEI as well to to show them that we were, uh, that we meant business, I suppose, for want of a better term. Um, they wanted to obviously make sure that it wasn't just like a token gesture or um, just something to, tick a box which definitely isn't the case um, and we had to present to them maybe October November time um, just to get their approval on everything and then maybe it took a few weeks for them to come back to us 
and give us the approval and, and grant us permission to us play in the league this coming year. So um, th- those are the logistics to setting it up initially. And um, in the last couple of months, um, there's a lot more logistics to it. Um, the same as the men's team, you know, a football club nowadays, there's so much things to do um, from getting coaches in. Um, Steve Feeney, the manager, we had to, you know, recruit a manager, a good quality manager as well. And Steve, um, who was with Ballina Mallard in the Northern Irish uh, League, he showed his intentions um, kind of how important it was to him that he left such a, a decent club in, in the North um, to come down and manage the team. Um, you know, and they, he's got some good quality coaches and good quality people in the backroom staff there. So they're all chipping in and helping out with all the various logistics around, around the women's team. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot to do, but it's, it's enjoyable, like it's good. And at least you kind of know you're putting something back into the community and everybody has a sense of, of pride that, you know, they're sort of part of this first women's national league team for the club. So, yeah, it's really good and positive. What has been the most, I suppose, difficult or maybe even surprising element for you out of the whole process? Um, I think the most surprising thing, um, probably just the, the goodwill of everybody around. Um, you know, we have a lot of supporters here in Sligo. They've really got behind the team, you know, and um, we, we've obviously got some, we're, we're trying our best to promote it as best we can on social media and, you know, the reactions to all of that um, has been amazing so far and we're I'm delighted sure to be Whoever runs your social media account is sick of me, like, tweeting them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that is a, a few of them on the first, so, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's what it's all about. So, you know, you have to put it, put in the groundwork like that. You know, you have to start. Nowadays, it's all kind of really about social media and promoting it through that. Um, you know, and, and my philosophy really, I suppose, and the clubs as well, is that if you're doing something for the men's side, so if you're announcing a sign-in for the men's team, you're going to take pictures, you're going to promote it as best you can, you're going to, you know, tag them in and try and promote that, that men's team player. So why wouldn't you do it for the... The, the women's team as well and that's what we're trying to do you know we're trying to do the exact same as we would for the men's team and not have any differences um and that's that's kind of what we have to do moving forward you know there, there, there can't really be a divide it has to be can everybody pulling in the right direction yeah we're seeing that more and more in the league now and the benefits of having that men's space behind i think the cup final really showed the shells ultras were out in force with their flares and stuff so if you can get even a fraction of that support in the first season, it'll go a long way just to generate an interest and Sligo becoming more attractive as a club. I think that's the way the league will go in general, that you will need to be associated with a men's team. Um, so you're already starting with some sort of fan base, which is amazing and hopefully drive interest and, and all that to, to your club. Yeah, no, it's been good so far. Like, you know, it's great to have a good fan base um, behind us and, like there's some clubs that probably just aren't ready at the moment, you know, they have a great men's team. Um, there's a few in the league that don't have a senior women's team either and look at if they are where they are and hopefully in the next couple of years or whatever, but how long it takes, you know, every every team in the league will have a women's team as well to marry the men's team and there might not just be one division, there might be two, you know, so it's only the start and for us, there's no rush on us, you know, we're, we're only kind of at, at the foundations now there's no pressure on the players or the staff or anything. We know that we have girls at 15 and 16 coming through, we're under 17, and it's about the pathway that, you know, it's not a results-driven business at the moment. It's just about um, developing the thing and making sure it's there for years to come. To pick up on what you said there about it not being a results-driven business, I suppose to throw it to you, Emma, because... It's great to set the whole thing up, but at the end of the day as well, like there are still matches to be played and like the team, it's always difficult being the first club coming into a league. We see it all the time in the women's game when there are like expansion teams or clubs brought into the league for the first time. And it is, it's difficult as that first season because you are learning so much and you are trying to meld together a group of players that haven't spent a lot of time together and facilities and everything else. What from a player's perspective, how is the team looking at this season in like training sessions and in those build up preseason games, knowing that that's the case? And I suppose, as Colin said, there, there isn't massive pressure from the club side, knowing that this is the first season. But how do you keep motivating yourself and how do you keep the team motivated? Uh, yeah. So, yeah, it'll be like we're well aware this season that there will definitely be um, some tough games like to take. But 
I suppose other things looking at us coming into the league are thinking right we're playing Sligo Rovers this weekend we're going to get three points from Sligo Rovers and it's just a given that's how other teams will be thinking towards us but we're actually we're, we've a really positive mindset at the moment and um, we've been building and building the last few weeks so teams coming down to us with that mindset we we hope to catch them on the hop like we're working towards being a really hard team to beat against the likes of their P Mount against Cairns, P Mount's team or Wexford Hughes, Shelburne, obviously all these big teams. We're going to make sure that we're as solid as possible in defence against teams like that, really. And it's as Karen knows in any football head, it'll all be about catching them kind of things on the hop or transition to attack or set pieces in them games will obviously be really important. And then obviously things for us to go and focus on. And I'm not saying that we're not going to get three points from them games, but we know that they'll be difficult games to play. And we obviously hope to catch them on the hop in some games. But, you know, we obviously want to be competing with the, the Athlones, the Treaty, United, the Corks, um, Galway. We, like, we want to compete with them teams. Like, we, we want to compete with everything, but we would be looking at certain games and we're thinking, right, we're going out here and we're going to try and get three points as well. Um, we're not going to be settling for beatings all, all season round. We know we're going to get some. We probably get plenty against the bigger clubs. But um, we're going to be a competitive team. Um, we're going to be driven in that sense. And we've we've had that like knocked into us the last few weeks. And every training session, every friendly game we're playing, I can genuinely say that we're seeing improvements in every game. And, you know, it's tough in pre-season because you have people on trials, you have people coming in and out, um, you have a squad um, a squad of players and you want to get all of these players game time in pre-season. So you're not working towards your starting 11. It's nowhere near that yet. You're constantly trying out new players in different positions. So we know that it'll take a while for us to come into a rhythm. But saying that every every game of pre-season so far, we've definitely seen improvements. Um, so that's something that's really positive. And I'm I'm personally going into the season like with a really positive attitude because the talent that I'm playing with and I get to see, um, it's something that's really motivating. And we will have tough games, as I said, but... We're not going to be a team going in, settling to finish last in the league. We're going to be pushing up as high as we can and as best as we can every game. I've already been keeping Karen going about all the times that they come across me now. I'm going to have my jersey on for the podcast. <laughs> yeah, maybe ways to make some of those improvements for last of the first game. Maybe, maybe try some new things out and for another while. Uh, and, and, uh, oh, sorry, continue. No, just touching on that as well. Like we have to remember as well that some some clubs will be putting in long journeys to come down to Sligo. Do you know what I mean? Like P Mount there, say you'll be traveling two and a half, maybe three hours. Some of you, Wexford Youths will be on a bus for five hours. Cork City will be on a bus for five hours. So, like when you're preparing for a game and we're playing at home against say P Mount or Dublin teams or Wexford, like that, that we'll be thinking of that too, right? Like then teams have traveled a long journey, like let's give them a good fight or a good rattle or let's, let's make them know that they're coming to the showgrounds and not give them any, any easy pushovers at the same time. Yeah. That as much goes as the same. Great. Yeah. As much as it's great that you're in the league, I was like, oh, that's so trick. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah. Yeah, obviously I've heard such great things about Sligo from Kathleen. It's like being on tours in Sligo every week on this podcast. But, <laughs> You'll have to stay down. Yeah, <laughs> Go surfing or something. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we should just do a special edition of the podcast so it's just like the kind of Kathleen takes Lego. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> After our payment game now. When they're at home, when they're away to us at the showgrounds. Oh, that's yeah. only if Karen can walk afterwards. <laughs> yeah, that's oh, right. no, I'm, 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 none of that. <laughs> Uh, that's purely a reference to all her talk about preseason training and how it's going. I swear. <laughs> Getting her. <harder. laughs> <laughs> it is like you said. I mean, there are plenty of opportunities. You never really know what a team is going to do. We spend plenty of time on this podcast talking about the women's super league and say a team like Leicester City, it's their first time in the league and they've done incredibly well and taken big points off people you wouldn't have expected of them and have kind of grown throughout the season. And I imagine when you're setting up a team or where you're developing a team, that's the sort of example you're looking to, you know, you're looking to get those points when you can. And as you said, rattle a few people when they come to Sligo or when you travel to them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And we're, we're actually probably starting out like, you know, remember the days of Castlebar Celtic back in the Women's National League, like 
that very first year of the cup final in the Viva is like a perfect example. Like the week before that, Rahini at the time, like they, they battered us, like I think it was like 9 0 in a league game the week before. The week after, we went and played them in the Viva, the very first cup final in the Viva and on TV. And, you know, we took them to extra time that day and they, they obviously ended up beating us 3 2. But that alone, like that always stands out in my head, like no matter how much of an underdog you are, like it doesn't matter. It goes out the window once the, the whistle takes off. Like it does. I think there's going to be some shocks in the league this season as well. Like there's been a lot of attrition of players moving around the top teams and losing teams and things like that so I really wouldn't be surprised if we see some scouts we saw them at the end of last season so I think everyone will be pretty wary yeah. of ye coming into the league um, it'd be great to see kind of a west rivalry we have a couple of rivalries in Dublin so we're looking out for mm-hmm. your Galway game I think that would be a good crack uh, to, to look at and get the fans in for that one as well <clears throat> yeah yeah definitely um, yeah 100% so like Galway will be an interesting one I suppose because we're like we'll be looking to take players off them hopefully like next season and vice versa that's just how the league works like and even the likes of Atlone who are only like an hour and a half up the road from us um like we unfortunately lost out to two Sligo girls like home slight like, home based Sligo girls who are playing for Atlone now this season um Marion Devaney and Roshi Malloy who are playing for Atlone like they unfortunately they're not signed with Rovers just by the time the team got announced and um, they already had like their pre-commitment to at loan and uh, so players like that even you're you're looking to like impress in a way so that they will want to come back during summertime and play with us because they're two exceptionally talented players and to add them to any squad would be a would be a great deal so um there'll be a few like battles and rivalries over this west way but like yeah we're, we're definitely looking forward to it not least I was going to say the general battle of taking people possibly from GA teams and trying to convert them over to the football as well because as you said earlier you know Saigo's always been very much especially for the women's game anyways it's been more of a GA county than it has been a football county so I'm curious to see how this in like the next couple of years might change things a little bit and will we see a little bit yeah. of a swap and will more players be convinced to come over to the football team rather than their club commitments or will they kind of balance them both or what way will it work out especially with the league I suppose moving more and more and I know we're still a bit away probably from getting any sort of professionalism into it but it's probably not all that distant either if things keep growing the way they are um, yeah I yeah, think I, um, sorry go on so, no well I was I was just going to touch on the Gaelic part there for a second because like um, that's always going to be a problem really where we are based in the west and um, it's obviously such a massive Gaelic area um, all around Connacht and up Donegal way. In particular, Donegal, because they're a senior team, they're usually competing or trying to compete for an All-Ireland final, like the last few years at least. And like there's players who are up there at the moment, like Karen, you would know, Geraldine McLaughlin, who played like the mm-hmm. World Student Games. Um, Roshi McCafferty. Roshi um, McCafferty. An exceptional talent at the moment, Amy Boyle Carr, who actually has a senior Irish international cap. And unfortunately, she's not even playing with us at the moment, even though she's just based in Donegal because of Gaelic commitments. So we are touching base with all these players, like, and trying to obviously encourage them as much as we can to come into the soccer. Um, but as again, as this area is such a massive Gaelic area, they're obviously preoccupied until at least summertime so that's always going to be a problem then you have the likes of Aileen Gilroy Rachel Cairns who are over in uh, and Sarah Rowe who are over in Australia at the moment obviously playing ball over there then all three of them are literally only from an hour up the road so technically we would be their closest club to play for they've all their Rachel and Aileen in particular um, have all went to IT Sligo so they have that connection with Sligo already so like when you think about it you could add them five or six players like alone I would say we'd be competing up the top of the league with the likes yeah, yeah, of Piedmont yeah. and Shells mm-hmm. and Wexford Utes because there is such talent here in the Northwest. It's just at the moment, the Gaelic are catching their eyes or Australia are obviously as well. So add them five or six players and like it's a completely like different squad altogether and you're, you're challenging for a title race really more than anything then. And Colin, you were going to say something on that as well, I think. Uh, yeah, I suppose just go back to the, the GA point. I think um, moving forward, you know, we have to keep an open mind in the both the both codes. Um, it, it can't be a thing in Sligo. Sligo is a small county and the Northwest is a small enough region. Like, we can't be batting against each other. 
you know, I think we need to work together as, as best as possible um, and come to towards the best solution for both parties. Um, you know, it's sometimes all just tit for tat between the supporters of both codes here. Um, you know, but I think as, as clubs and as organisations, we just need to work together on it. And, and kind of, if a girl wants to play both, we should be able to let them play both, you know, for the betterment of, of both codes, um, rather than kind of making them feel left out of one or the other, you know. So, um, yeah, as, as Emma said before, there's a lot of talent playing Gaelic around the place. So it's up to us and up to, up to I suppose, the team to prove themselves and to show these girls that there's a good team kind of playing in the league and that they may want to come someday and play for them as well, you know. That's great. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining us. It's been such an interesting conversation. And as is well established, I'm very excited to see how you get on this season and come support you in some matches as well. I know Card is equally excited to play against you. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah. 5th of March. Yeah, I know. Not long coming. I know. I'm going to go for oh a run. God. I'm going to be running after you. Mm. <laughs> oh, God, I don't know about that. <laughs> Stay within a 10-yard radius. <laughs> yeah, but the two must be just doing loops around the centre. Yeah. <laughs> I'll Please do it if you do. Not to get <laughs> <nutmeg>. <laughs> oh, no, we go crack. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on, guys. Thanks Thank you very much. Us. Cheers. Yeah, thanks See very much. Up. Appreciate it. That's all from us on this week's Koi Gig Pod on OTB Sports in association with Cabri FC, official snack partner to the Republic of Ireland women's national team. Thanks to Karen, to Emma and to Colin. And we will chat to you all again next week.